It is just a huge honor to bring back my buddy for a four time. Ed, you're the only one that's been on the show four times, man. That is a, that is a legend in itself. Um, uh, we just have so much to talk about, Howard. We could, you know, go on for hours. And we both have four kids, and we both, uh, oh my God, um, we, I got we have you by a few grandkids, though. You you got what? I got you by a few grandkids. Well, I got eight, four kids, and eight grandkids. Oh, you're up to eight grandkids. Yeah. Oh, I, my kids, my my kids better get busy. I only have seven. Oh, I got you beat by one. But I, but I have one that hasn't even started, and. Um, you know, maybe one other that's still in the game. So I think when all said and done, I'm going to be at double digits. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I got hit by a bunch of out of nowhere. The oldest girl, Janelle, she had like, uh, she had two kids. It was done. Then had two mistakes, one after the other. <laughs> so he's at, I mean, what were the odds of that? Uh, so that was great. But, but uh, Dr. Zuckerberg is a 1978 graduate of NYUCD where I think 7% of all American dentists graduated from uh, NYU and owned his own practices in Brooklyn and Dobbs Ferry, New York from 79 to 2013 before moving to California. Dr. Z was an early tech adopter, placing his first PC in his home-based office in 1986 and pioneering technologies such as intro cameras in the 80s, air abrasion, lasers, and digital radiography in the 90s and created a paperless office and utilized CAD CAM technology 20 years ago, well before his mainstream. His early adoption caught the eyes of industry leaders like everyone, uh, everyone at Dentaltown, um, who listened to write articles, lecture, beta test new technologies, and vice startups in the oral health field. Um, Dr. Zuckerberg now acts as a chief dental officer at Keystone Bio, an exciting biopharma company with a biologic um, to eradicate P. gingivalis. And he also acts as a venture partner for Reverb Partners, the first independent venture fund for oral health. He can be reached via his website at painlessdrz.com or his Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash painless social media. Hey, Ed, I was so excited driving over here to see you, um, to podcast you today that I, I think I ran 20 red lights just in your name <laughs> because I can't think of a smarter macroeconomic guy to address something that you and I have never seen in our career. Um, we know that Paul Volcker crushed inflation in 82, and I was a um, sophomore at Creighton University, and and um, and then for the next 40 years, there was no inflation. And in that yeah, 40... Really. I mean, I remember 81 was crazy. We bought our house that year, and the interest rates were 18% for a home mortgage. And, and, and um, they, the banks didn't even want to lend it because they were afraid it was going to 25. Um, that was nuts time. Yeah, when I bought my house, for the, uh, my first mortgage was 14%, and I thought I was a genius because the guy he's buying it from, he had financed for like 16 and a half, and I thought, oh, I'm at 14. But but yeah. then, but but Ed, in the following 40 years, when everybody had stable money, no inflation, they all locked down their revenues with, with these PPO insurance tracks. And a lot of dentists say, you know, oh, I'm not on a PPO. It's like, well, do you take Delta? And it's like, yeah, well, does Delta set your fee? That's a PPO. So these dentists are all locked down on a fee schedule. They're just very inflexible. Some of these you can't even change for a year at a time. Yet inflation, and, and, and when the government's saying inflation's 8%, and that that's like an F on the report card, you know the letter grade's worse than they say it is. I mean, hell, real estate went up 19%. Commodities went up 30%. How could inflation be 9%? So what does this say I, I just want you to give us a rant on what you, I know you do a lot of venture capital money partners, but what is your rant on inflation in dentistry when everybody's revenue prices are fixed, but every week they're trying to replace a hygienist and the last one wanted 40 to hour. Now you can't get any of them for under 50. And every time you turn around, everything's more expensive. What 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 does your mind think about this, and what do you think these young kids should be thinking about? You know, it's um, I've seen the deterioration of the business aspect of our profession over the years, and it's and it's been pretty sad. Um, you know, I was pretty fortunate to convince my wife, who um, was is a psychiatrist. And managed care crushed psychiatry long before it. it crushed dentistry. And she took 10 years off to raise our kids 
And when she went back, it was awful. Um, and, and, was, and how did how did managed care crush psychiatry? Um, well, they they took the the least skilled person they could to do the task that they were capable of. So I, I think what attracted her to psychiatry in the first place was she really liked talking to people and helping people. And um, when she went back after her 10 year hiatus, they said, well, we understand all that, but it's cheaper for us to have a social worker or a, um, a PhD, you know, someone with a master's or a PhD, um, a psychologist, doing the therapy and since you went to medical school and you could write drugs we're gonna have to we're gonna have you deal with the heavy hitters you know the um people who were suicidal or had some you know severe psychopath you know psychopath uh, pathology diseases and so her practice was hospital based she'd spend a lot of time fighting with insurance companies you know she'd have like um a young gal who tried to commit suicide and she'd have to decide uh, in three days if this is someone that needed to either be institutionalized or someone who could be let go because the insurance would only pay for three days of hospitalization. And she'd have to, she'd spend, come home and say, how was your day? Well, I spent four hours on the phone with the insurance company trying to get an extra day or two for this girl to stay in the hospital, the 16 year old girl. And, and after a year of hearing her complain, I said, hey, you're obviously missing the kids. I mean, you were home with the kids for 10 years. You know, they're now, the youngest is five in kindergarten. The oldest was 12. And she's at work. And um, my home, my office was in the house. So I kind of blocked out from three to four an hour. I let my hygienist work that hour, but I kind of triaged the kids when they came home from school and dealt with any emergencies and, and tried to be like Mr. Mom. Um, but I finally said to her, hey, why don't you come home and why don't you use your skills to run my office, run everything non-clinical? And her insights into having everything run smoothly were incredible. Um, you know, aside from the fact that she managed the, the patients and the staff with, a, with skill, um, she also took a tremendous burden off me by running everything non-clinical. Let me focus on running a, a great clinical ship. And in like her first two years with the office, we doubled our gross income in the early 1990s from like 400,000 to 800,000. So um, it was uh, also gave her exactly what she wanted. You know, she felt like she was using her skill set. And she was a valuable uh, person running the, everything non-clinical in the practice. She was home for the kids when they came home from school. And with the home-based practice, we were able to take care of whatever we needed to um, in the office in the evening. So it really worked out well for us. But it also recession-proofed and PPO-proofed my practice because with her skills, we, um, we kind of, I said to her, you know, let's crack this dental phobia thing. You know, I want to become known as the, the office to go to for people with dental phobias. And a lot of them spent a lot of time with her, you know, dealing with their phobias. And, and we also looked at all the things people were phobic about and tried to change our office um, to help deal with those phobias. So, you know, we, we became the place to go to. I mean, our slogan was, you know, we truly cater to cowards. Um, so, um, you know, when people who are terrified of going to the dentist find someone they're finally comfortable with, you don't have to worry that they, when their job gets a, a new uh, dental plan, that they're going to leave you because you're not on their PPO. I mean, they're just thrilled to have someone who can take care of them and they're comfortable getting their teeth done and, and, you know, if you're using the latest technology and you exude quality in your practice, you're basically free from that. So I, I was pretty, you know, exempt from the PPO. Uh, we never, we never um, had to deal with that stuff, um, which 
you know, kind of, I wasn't really ready for that when I launched my second career. By the way, you know, you're the person who launched my second career when I finished practicing wet finger dentistry. You do realize that, right? I do not know that. <laughs> so I think it was 2010, and I had a really good front desk person. She was so good at screening calls that she once hung up on my mother. <laughs> so... Um, she comes back to me in 2010, in the summer of 2010, Facebook had had um, had opened to business pages for a couple of years by then. And she goes, there's a guy on the phone by the name of Howard Ferran who says you will talk to him. <laughs> and I looked at her and said, you're right, I will talk to him. And, and we didn't know each other from, you know, from a hole in the wall. Um, although obviously I was an early townie um, so I had been, you know, posting and, 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 uh, you know, an active participant, but you and I had never met and we got on the phone and, and I, your first words were, Ed, you're a dentist. So at that point <laughs> I knew, I, you know, I always knew you were a smart guy, but now I knew you were brilliant, right? <laughs> oh my God. So, so at the time you were trying to conquer the world. And you were trying to get become friends with every dentist in the world on Facebook. And Facebook told you that you couldn't have any more friends. He said, Ed, Facebook's not letting me have any more friends. I got 5,000 friends. They shut me out. I said, Howard, it sounds like you set up your, pay, your, your business presence as a personal profile, not as a business page. I said, we can fix that. I can help you fix that. We had to transfer your personal page to a business page. I said, you're going to lose everything. You're going to lose all the content on your page, but you're going to keep all the people. So all 5,000 of those friends will now become fans of your new page. So I, 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 I helped you do that. We converted your page to a business page. And then you said to me, Ed, you got to write an article for Dental Town. Um, does my office need a Facebook page? So I think that was like September of 2010. I wrote that article. It was very well received and um, good feedback. And, and you guys said, hey, um, you got to write something else. You know, what else are you passionate about? I said, well, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to teach my colleagues how to do dentistry. I'm a, I'm a really good dentist, but I'm not going to teach anyone how to do dentistry. But I'm, I'm really passionate about technology. I, I've been an early tech adopter, you know, as you mentioned in, in my intro, you know, I had an IBM PC XT in 1986 in the office. Um, the first intraoral camera, AccuCam, by the way, um, the guy who built that in the 80s, a guy by the name of Steve Mortensen, now has a really cool new technology that we just, uh, they just pitched to us. It's a, an, an ultrasonic probe, really cool stuff. You know, we can talk more about what I'm doing for Revere Partners. Um, but technology, I always loved technology. It kept me from getting bored. Um, it always, it made dentistry fun and the patients really Loved seeing the technology. And, and, you know, one thing about technology, you know, you can be a great dentist and, you, and not use new technology, um, but the patients really perceive dentists that use the technology as being better than dentists who did not. Um, oh, there's a podiatrist out here and all the billboards are laser foot surgeon, laser foot surgeon. And I said to him, I said, um, well, you know, Making a flap with a 15 blade would take a second, but doing it with a laser, like a carbon dioxide, what, what are you using? He goes, dude, that's all marketing. He says, I use a, I use a laser for like the first minute that I switched to a 15 blade. He says, he said, he said his laser was all, all marketing for him. But I, I'm going I'm to hold you down to two more points because but so back. I, so I didn't finish. I, oh, okay. I, I, I was going to say that. Right after those two articles were read, we were, were written. I wrote an article on, um, I think on technology was my second article, December, 2010, something like that. After those, we had our first major life event um, since getting married and having kids. And that was our first grandchild. 
was born in May of 2011. And in California, of course, because Mark had already, you know, was well entrenched with Facebook. And my oldest daughter, Randy, was running marketing for Facebook. And my youngest daughter, Arielle, uh, was in the process of graduating from Claremont McKenna. So we had three out of four kids in California already. And here I am still tolling away in New York. And my wife's holding the baby and says, I'm staying. Are you coming? So that was basically the end. It took two years to sell the house and transfer the practice. But that was basically the end of my wet finger dental career. And concomitant with those two articles in Dentaltown, I started getting um, phone calls and email inquiries to speak. So that kind of launched my dental, my career as second career as a dental educator. And then from there, um, startups asking my advice on new, on new technologies and whatnot. So all got launched because of a phone call from this crazy guy who insisted he get through my receptionist to talk to me. Well, um, I really enjoyed uh, dinner with you and your wife, Karen, a psychiatrist. Reminds me a lot of uh, T-Bone, uh, Tarun Agarwal, his wife's psychiatrist, too. And I, I think they were uh, fabulous discussions because um, I noticed that um, um, both uh, your wife and T-Bone's wife um, thought that dentists, people attracted to dentistry, people who go to eight years of college become a dentist, that they have some unique psychiatric parameters you might say just like a, like a vet i mean you show him a lab he knows it's got different diseases than a chihuahua but uh, they both seem to think that uh dentists um had a, a greater propensity of a few issues you might say <laughs> and uh yeah yeah and, and I, I that would be that would be the greatest podcast to have your wife talk to t-bone's wife i mean it could be on his podcast he's got one but i i would love to have, every time i see t-bone i always think of that podcast that'd be the perfect podcast karen and his wife talking about uh what dennis knew because they always seem to have all these problems with um burnout and depression and and all these things like that but i want to hold you back your your daughter um when she left uh facebook i mean uh everybody in the wall street journal thought she was a marketing genius but what do you think what do you think um she would tell dentists that and going forward with inflation's back after 40 years um we don't know what the price are i mean so you're either going to lock down these ppo fees which are about a 38 percent reduction in the fee for service by a dentist who doesn't even spend three percent on advertising it's like why wouldn't you spend 10 percent on advertising to get your full fee of a dollar they don't want to do that but they don't blink at signing a ppo where their fee drops 38 percent and, and they'll, they'll just they'll sign it in one second. It's like, hey, here's all your fees, 38% contraction. Like, okay, where do I sign? And you say, well, leave your fee and advertise on Facebook or direct, do something, direct mail, email, Facebook, uh, something. So, so I want to ask you, what do you think uh, you and your daughter Randy would tell the dentist to just, you're not going to win. You're not going to, you're not going to win, beat the PPO. You're not going to beat Delta shut the hell up, sign the contract, drop 38%, and just focus on budgets and cutting costs? Or do you think she would say, and Ed would say, no, man, stick to your fee of a full dollar and spend a good 5 10% trying to attract um, the half of America who doesn't even have dental insurance anyway? Why? So, so, yeah. so how would you answer that, Ed? You know, um, there's two ways to practice dentistry now. Like you said, you can charge full fee. And if you're going to be successful, the patients have to see the value in the care that is rendered at your office. Because, you know, if, if you're going to, if you're going to try and be your own boss um, and yet sign on to all these PPOs, I mean, that's a losing battle. I mean, the DSOs have won that game. Um, so for, for the low fee um, dentistry, um, the DSOs have figured out how to make uh, dentistry profitable on the low end of the, of the spectrum. And um, it's up to them to market their DSOs so that they can attract people 
who are obviously the people who are all they're interested in is is the is their wallet are going to go for lower fee stuff. Um, but but the real reason that they're successful is because the dentists that are really trying to run high fee, full fee practices, um, you know, pardon the expression, but we really suck at marketing. You know, we don't spend the money and we don't spend the time educating people about what makes us stand apart from the practices and the DO office, DSO offices that, um, you know, from a quality point of view. I mean, if we're not doing that, then choosing a dentist really doesn't come down to much more than choosing a place to buy a refrigerator. You're just going to go for the place that's uh, the store that's most convenient or the store that has the cheapest price. If you don't see the difference in value that's being offered in an office. So offices really need to explain and really show the value of their services to their patients. Um, and, and it's a hell of a lot more than just dropping PPOs. I mean, when, when I f first came out to California, I started, uh, um, I was kind of solicited by a gal with a practice here in Palo Alto. And, and um, she said, hey, um, you know, why don't you use my office as a place to see some patients if you want? And I was looking at her practice, and she's, she's really trying to be high quality, high technology, and yet she's taking all these PPOs. And I, one day I pulled her aside and said, is this a hobby? Yeah, is your husband supporting you? Because yeah. <laughs> you can't possibly be making any money, to, you know, with high salaries, you know, high tech in your office, and you're on all these PPOs. And she said, no, 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 we're good. And I go, well, are you, are you drawing an active salary? I mean, what's going on? And she goes, well, not really. And I said, so it is a hobby. Uh, you know, and I kind of convinced her that. And I said, let me help you transform because I see a lot of problems here that, you know, things that you got to do that you're not doing now. Um, and she didn't go all, the, all in with me. She kind of tried to do it herself. And, and she called me up about a month later, crying hysterically. I said, what happened? She said, well, I tried to take your advice. I tried to drop all the PPOs, including Delta Dent. And I said, okay. And she said, and I figured the first patient I'd pick, her husband was like a former early Facebook employee who had, was worth a ton of money, okay? I mean, millions. And, and the woman was in the middle of uh, Invisalign therapy. And she said, on, on her way out one day, I said to her, you know, we're not going to be taking Delta Dental anymore. Um, they're not keeping up with inflation. We can't run a high quality practice and, and be on Delta Dental. And the woman looked at her without batting an eyelash. This is a woman whose husband, you know, her family net worth is a couple hundred million dollars looked at her without batting an eyelash and said, that's okay. I'm sure we'll be able to find another practice in the neighborhood that accepts Delta Dental. So that strategy backfired because it wasn't properly implemented, you know, and, and the fact that they were very different from an office that was uh, taking PPOs had not been that, that information had the patient was not convinced. So how, how do you do it? I mean, you know, obviously marketing, you know, for a lot of dentists, a full letter word, but um, certainly you've got to, um, sh showing value can be done in your communications and the work you do, um, discussing, you know, the laboratory that you use that a lot of lab a lot of offices, you know, can't afford to use high quality labs and be competitive. So they send their lab work to Costa Rica or China or wherever, or whatever they do, they use cut rate dental labs. They use um, gray market materials that may not be high quality materials. Um, the staff, you know, could be not well trained. You know, there could be shortcuts taken here, there and everywhere. And, you know, it, it can be done with social media marketing. It can be done with other kinds of marketing. But really, 
it's it's best done in the office itself by showing and explaining all the quality things that your office does that increase the bond between you and the patient and help the patient see the value in your practice. Um, Ed, when I uh, study everything you're doing, um, it almost looks like you have some deep rooted hatred for P. gingivalis. Um, <laughs> did, did, did something go wrong in your childhood with uh, uh, P. gingivalis? Were you traumatized? You know, Howard, I, I've, I've done a lot of startup advising in the last 10 years. Some of it's really fun, really cool stuff. You know, like robotics and dentistry. There's a company that's going to, you know, when I first did CAD CAM in my office almost 20 years ago, I thought this was the coolest thing, right? Patient can walk out of the office the same day with a permanent restoration, no more laboratory. You know, I mill the scan and mill the crown. The patients loved it. But it's pretty time consuming. It's like two hours, right? Um, and a lot of downtime in there. So hopefully you got some other patients while the tooth being while the, the ceramic crown's being milled, while you know, someone maybe a staff member is doing the scan. Um, it's still two hours for the patient in the chair. So imagine this. This is this is my vision for a couple of years from now, and it's actually coming to to reality through one of our uh, portfolio companies at Revere and a company that I'm advising called Cybernonics. Um, imagine you've done a scan, you know, a 3D, a cone beam or whatnot, um, and, and you've actually um, now prepared for a crown restoration virtually, even before the patient comes in the office. So forget about the step that we're doing now with CAD CAM where you prep the tooth and then you scan it. We know before we cut the tooth what the tooth's going to look like. How do we know? Because we're going to have the computer robotically prepare the tooth. And, the, and the, we know because we know beforehand what the crown prep's going to look like, we have the crown fabricated before the patient comes into the office. Okay, so imagine the patient sits in the chair now, you administer anesthesia, five minutes later, you snap on this jig that has the handpiece embedded in the jig. The handpiece had the is attached to a computer that has all the information it needs about the opposing arch, the adjacent teeth, the gingival position, everything. In about five minutes, the computer preps the tooth. So now the patient's been in the office 10 minutes and their tooth is prepped. And guess what? On my bracket tray, I've got the crown already because we know what that tooth's going to look like beforehand. So now I do some adjusting, cement and bond the crown in. Half an hour, patient's out with their permanent crown. One visit, permanent crown, half an hour. So really cool technologies like that we're seeing every day and we're picking and choosing who we're going to help out, you know, who we're going to provide advice to, who we're going to um, provide funding to, et cetera. Um, and, you know, none of these are really life changing, but they're cool, maybe efficient ways to do things than we're doing now. But about a year and a half ago, um, someone brought this company to me called Keystone Bio. And, and it wasn't my typical company because it's not a technology, you know. I, um, but I, I really, I, I got convinced to take this call. And as I'm taking the call, it was almost like I had to hold on to the armrests on my chair. It was that um, earth shattering for me and that groundbreaking. I mean, every dentist knows that there's an oral systemic connection to, dent to disease in the mouth, especially gum disease. Uh, we've all seen it. I know I've seen it. I've seen young patients die of heart attacks, people with fulminating periodontal disease that either refused treatment or didn't come back for care. And then one guy age 42, another one 45, passing away of a heart attack without a family history of heart disease. That's not normal. 
yet we couldn't really put the finger on it on the pathway other than that you know we knew there's dental disease and gum disease i had another gal um came in she was pregnant um five months pregnant um with an abscess um took all i could do to convince her to let me take an x-ray uh to see what the problem was periapical abscess i spoke to the obstetrician uh, she had four bad molars, four of them, all done by the same local yeah. dentist. That's another story for another day. Um, anyhow, they all needed to be endos retreated, crowns redone, et cetera. And even though the obstetrician blessed the treatment because, hey, get rid of this bacterial infection during the pregnancy, especially the middle trimester, the safest time to treat the patient, patient didn't want to do it until after she gave birth. Um, so we got her through the initial crisis with uh, antibiotic. Um, I think eight months pregnant, she lost the baby. Now, I don't know what happened, but raging bacteria in the mouth certainly didn't help the situation. Was it the cause? Who knows? Um, after a while, she came back. We redid those four endos and crowns. And the next year she got pregnant and had twins. So, you know, the Lord works in, in interesting ways. But, um, you know, we, we know, but we can't really, what do we say to our patients? Hey, the mouth's connected to the body. You know, you got gum disease. It's going to lead to a higher incidence of heart disease for you. Um, well, how does that happen? Uh, you know, it's inflammation. It's bacteria. You know, it, it's nothing really convincing to the patient and that lack of convincing bears out by the fact that people don't come back um nothing more frustrating than treating a patient for you know they let you go through the care you do scaling and root planning you do flap surgery whatnot and you explain to them hey we didn't cure your gum disease we just arrested it for now if you want to keep this at bay, you've got to do a great job with your home care at home, and you've got to come back frequently so that I or the hygienist can um, pick up the deposits um, as they rebuild up and the bacteria. And then the next time you see them, it's like two, three years later, and it's like you never treated them. They got, they got to go through everything all over again. And I think the problem is we haven't put a name to it or a process. Keystone Bio has done that. Um, we know that P. gingivalis is the keystone pathogen of gum disease. That work has been established by um, a couple of periodontists, um, Haji, Haji Shengalis and, and Rich Darvo, um, wrote some great articles um, on, on P. gingivalis as the keystone pathogen. Uh, P. gingivalis itself has had. Uh, something like 10,000 articles written in the last 60, 70 years about it. There's a conference. I didn't know this until like two months ago. There's a, con a two-day conference every year on P. gingivalis. The world's leading experts on P. gingivalis meet to discuss P. gingivalis for two days every year. And, um, you know, the, uh, there was a study done where they studied the brains of people with Alzheimer's disease. And virtually 100% of these brains show the toxic proteins of, of P. gingivalis in the brain. That's 100% correlation between P. gingivalis and Alzheimer's disease. And so, but the researchers hadn't been able, until Keystone Bio's work, to figure out how it gets in the brain. The bug itself, like almost all bugs, can't cross the blood-brain barrier. And in fact, you won't find P. gingivalis in the brain. You won't find it in the heart. You won't find it in the liver. You won't find it in cancerous digestive tissue lesions. And yet, we know from scientific research that there's correlation between P. gingivalis and all these maladies, heart disease, strokes, um, Alzheimer's, 
Digestive cancers like esophageal cancer, colorectal cancer, oral cancer, esophageal cancer, um, diabetes control, all these things correlated to the presence of P. gingivalis, and the researchers can't figure it out because they can't find the bug. Well, the answer is, if you look at an electron microscopic um, picture, and I can, um, if I can share my screen here, okay, you see, you see that um, uh, slide on the screen, on yeah. your screen here. Yep. So that's an, that's an electron micrograph of an organism of PG. And you see the arrow pointing to these little vesicles outside the, uh, the organism. Yep. Uh, so PG produces toxic proteins. We call them ginger pains. And these toxic proteins are from the gum infection are released into the bloodstream. Those toxic proteins are what does the dirty work of P. gingivalis, okay? And they're spread to the end organs in the body from the local gingival infection through the bloodstream. And we've, we've, we've analyzed what they do in all the various tissues. So they cross the blood-brain barrier. They're able to cross the blood-brain barrier, which is why we find the toxic proteins of P. gingivalis there, not the bacteria itself. They also cause, and, and once they're in the brain, you know, all kinds of bad stuff happens from these toxic proteins. Um, you have uh, um, beta amyloid plaque formation. Um, you've got um, destruction of the neuronal transmission in the brain, which leads to dementia. Um, in the vessels of the heart, they... Uh, slide here of the heart the vessels of the heart they cause an increased permeability of the lining of the blood vessels in response to that the, the body produces calcifications calcifications in the vessels lead to atherosclerosis or narrowing of the arteries which lead to heart attacks high blood pressure and strokes um, in the liver uh, P the toxic proteins of P. gingivalis, not the bug itself, but the toxic proteins find their way into the liver and they impair glycogen synthesis, which means the body's not breaking down sugar and, uh, and processing it as it should. So it's almost impossible to treat diabetics with uncontrolled periodontal infections. And, uh, and, and the list of diseases goes on and on. I mean, I've got a, a short list here of all things that studies correlate with P. gingivalis. So um, if you accept all this stuff here that's going on and realize that P. gingivalis is the driver of all of its major inflammatory diseases of mankind, dentists are sitting on the potential here to be the uh, um, to be the, the deliverer of care that can essentially be the greatest have the greatest effect on the overall general health of mankind, uh, better than any medical practitioner, so to speak. Um, and so how do we go about getting rid of P. gingivalis? Because just scaling and root planning won't do it. It comes back within a month. It returns. Um, and we're able to identify the population. The numbers are ridiculously high. And people in my age group, in our age group, Howard, over 60, over 80% of us have significant clinical levels of P. gingivalis in our mouth. Even... The young uns, 30 and over, almost half the population have P. gingivalis infections. Now, P. gingivalis without concomitant periodontal disease may not be super dangerous. The key to um, the people who are really at risk is not necessarily just the presence of PG, which we can test for, by the way, with simple salivary tests, um, but really what we really need to know is the levels of toxic proteins circulating in our bloodstream. 
And that can only be detected with a blood test, which is not available yet, but which Keystone Bio is working on, in addition to a biologic that Keystone Bio already has that's in phase one trials right now um, with a with a human population testing, um, where uh, we can actually eradicate P. gingivalis at the level of the gum line. And if we can eradicate it at the level of the gum line, we can shut out P. gingivalis releasing toxic proteins in the in the bloodstream, and we can make a serious dent on Alzheimer's disease, heart disease, digestive cancers, rheumatoid arthritis, diabetes, the, the list goes on and on and on. Um, and so the team at Keystone Bio actually discovered this kind of serendipitously based on a study that was done. There was actually a phase one trial done on this biologic drug back in 1995 in the UK. It was a very small sample set done at a, at a, a medical dental school in, in, in the UK in 95. Um, it's called the Booth Study. And they only had 14 patients in the study. But what they did was they divided them into two groups, seven each. And they did, all of them had been tested and found to have significant levels of P. gingivalis and gum disease. So they did scaling and root planning on all of them. And then in the control group, um, they gave them a placebo, uh, seven people in the control. And then in the treatment group, they administered this biologic, um, this biologic drug, which for lack of a better name, we'll call KB001 for Keystone Bio. And then they followed up these 14 patients and all the seven people in the control group that got the placebo had a return to normal levels of PG in less than a month, even after thorough scaling and root plan. The seven patients that got the, the KB001 the earliest return of PG noted was nine months. So the administration of this biologic was able to eradicate PG for a minimum of nine months in 100% of the people that were in the study. Um, and no one had any adverse effects. So obviously, we're gonna, we've got a larger study group now. The studies are being done in Australia which has a favorable testing climate that's transferable and accepted often by, you know, the FDA in the U S and, um, you know, we hope to have our safety and efficacy, general safety and efficacy, um, in six months and then, uh, break out into a phase two where we target people who have early Alzheimer's disease and, periodontal disease with P. gingivalis infection and hopefully demonstrate either an arresting of symptoms compared to the control group or a reversal of symptoms compared to the control group. Um, hey, so Ed, I want to, I want to ask you a question on this whole subject. I can't think of a greater mind to ask, but um, there's a lot of um, smart minds like you and talking about fecal matter transplants when you look at the oral cavity and P. gingivalis and streptococcus mutans and all that, do you think um, it's pretty connected to the other end, 30 feet down, where proctologist colleagues work in the um, gut microbiome? And do you think there's going to be um, a connection someday between um, gut microbiome and oral disease in the mouth? Do you think oh, you'll be... Not someday. That that connection is already established now. That's there now. There's two especially notorious bacteria in the body. Um, you have P. gingivalis, which resides primarily in the mouth, and you have H. pylori, which provide which resides primarily in the gut. And both of these bacteria are highly highly evolved bacteria that have avoided. Um, in many cases, detection and avoided the ability of our immune system to clean them up. So um, 
you know, obviously the mouth is, is connected and we know for a fact that one of the modes of action of P. gingivalis is through the gut. Um, the gut, you know, it has direct seeding, um, you know, from into the bloodstream of feeding the uh, uh, toxic proteins into the bloodstream from the mouth. But the secondary route is through dysbiosis of the gut. So it's interesting that um, you mentioned fecal transplant because um, one of the companies that we actually invested in at Revere Partners uh, is a company called Brickbuilt. And um, I met these guys shortly after I started my role as chief dental officer for Keystone Bio. And, and, and the guy who looked like he, he looked like he hadn't started shaving yet, but yet he'd been a PhD and studied um, uh, P. gingivalis, I think, for like 17 years. So um, he was a, a lot older than he looked on the call. But anyway, he wasn't certain that we should be eradicating P. gingivalis and that that was the route to go. You know, it's kind of like, well, if we eradicate P. gingivalis, who knows, you know, some of the other bad players in the mouth might take over and might be equally bad. Well, we, we don't know that. We do know P. gingivalis is a nightmare. And we and and um, we haven't found any beneficial effects of having PG, so we can't see anything, uh, any 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 negative aspect to removing PG. Especially, um, we're not going to try and remove PG blindly, um, but through our tests where we uh, are developing a, a blood test to develop. Uh, to find the toxic proteins in the bloodstream, we can target the proper people who are really at risk. Um, but at the same time, we I didn't mention, we're also working on a vaccine to give to young people, which we may have the ability to eliminate PG from ever taking a foothold in, that, in, their, in their lives, much like we administer Gardasil now against HPV infections. But Brickbuilt's theory, and, and, and we were actually rewarded very quickly for our investment in, in Brickbuilt at Revere Partners because they were actually taken over, I think, within a few months after we invested in them. Um, they were bought out. Their concept was to alter the microbiome in the mouth, you know, much like you do a fecal transplant where you're altering the microbiome in the colon um, by administering you know, bacteria, which they, you know, are beneficial and hopefully can control some of the bacterias which are evil. Um, the bottom line is the root of gum disease, you know, with biofilm subgingivally will never change. Um, we still, as dentists, hold the key to that therapy. We still got to do scaling and root planning, debride the biofilm, get rid of the bacteria, get to a baseline, and then with Keystone Bio's drug, which will be administered by dentists and hygienists um, in liquid form, you know, like with a blunt irrigation needle irrigated subgingivally after completing scaling and root planning. Um, and since we know we can eradicate it for up to nine months, you know, we're going to be doing this once or twice annually on our patients for the rest of their lives and have a significant impact on. Um, you know, lessening the threat of these major life maladies. So what's got you more excited, uh, Keystone Bio or um, Re Revere Partners? Uh, Revere Partners VC for VentureCapital.com. Which, which, uh, one, which one's got you more excited? You know, I, I love the work I do at Revere. I mean, I, I sit in on three to four new pitches every week. And yeah, you know, some of them, Dang, I, can tell, I can tell kind of right away, you know, and, and, and I'm not the only, I'm not the only venture partner. I mean, we've got, you know, five, six venture partners at Revere and we are literally inundated with pitches from companies, um, you know, to, for us to, you know, invest and lend our expertise and help them grow. You know, the exciting thing about Revere um, is our investor base is mostly like a lot of dentists are our biggest investors. 
uh, Dennis investing in what they know and what they believe in. And because we've recruited many of the best KOLs in the dental industry to be on our advisory panel, we've got the greatest dental minds looking at these companies and people with the vision to be able to see these pitches and figure out what's going to be successful and what's not. So like some of the things on my plate right now is a company with a, um, with a chemical that can be administered, you know, orally either via toothbrush or a rinse that will dissolve away significant amounts of plaque and tartar. And, you know, we think this might uh, reduce the time that it takes your hygienist in your office to do a prophylaxis by 50% or more. Um, plus if we can get to dissolve a lot of that calculus and, and plaque in their home care regimen, um, you know, we might be able to uh, minimize um, the disease process itself. Um, I already mentioned the robotics company to you. Um, we've got a company that's got a novel way of dealing with, um, um, you know, treatment for allergies. Um, I, I want to go. I want to go back and ask you the age-old question. Uh, I'm going to ask you to make a prediction, and this one's going to get you in trouble. When I was in dental school, I graduated from UMKC in 87. And we had a couple of instructors that told us freshman year that we were making a serious mistake going into dentistry because <laughs> uh, P. gingivalis and streptococcus, no, not P. gingivalis, but streptococcus mutans was already had a vaccine under trial and you are literally wasting your time. By the time you're two to three years out of dental school, these kids will be vaccinated. They're still asking this ad. It's now 2022. Do you yeah. think someday your children's children's children? I heard, I heard, children... I heard with fluoride and sealants, there's not going to be any more decay. And and den they said if you're going to be go to dental school, the only job to be is to go into orthodontics because decay is not going to be an issue anymore. Well, we all see how that turned out, right? But do do you think? I mean, I see on your website where it says. Uh, um, Keystone Bio is advancing a clinically validated biotherapeutic treatment, KB001 MAB, for the elimination of um, porphyromonas gingivalis and all of its virulent factors, including the outer membrane vesicles and their toxic uh, protein. Um, do you think, do you still think, and then the pandemic, the, we the weirdest thing about the pandemic for my whole experience is that how they actually isolated the virus and made a vaccine for it in like under a year. I mean, I, I couldn't believe they could just the logistics. I mean, humans are so complicated and yeah, spread you out. Know, even with the vaccine, you still see a ton of people getting sick. So that's going to be an ongoing work in progress. I think what we're going to see is the vaccine for um, COVID is going to be like a flu shot. You know, it's going to alter and mutate every year and you're going to, you're going to get like, a new COVID vaccine every year you're going to take. But do you, do you think uh, vaccines will be a part of our clinical uh, dentistry in the, in the future? Or, I mean, do you think they're going to make a significant dent in dental I, I disease? I think it's certainly going to be an adjunct. I mean, if we've got a vaccine against PG um, that we're administering to the young population, you know, we can hope that there's going to be, you know, if not necessarily a lot less gum disease, there's certainly going to be a lot less oral systemic related diseases, less of heart disease, less uh, Alzheimer's and stuff like that. So um, are vaccines going to eradicate dental disease at all? No, there'll always be need for dentists. So I want to, and I, I can't believe I've, uh, we've, we're, uh, we're coming up on one hour already. And it's always the fastest hour of the year we're talking to you. Um, but, Ed, but basically, um, if I talk to 10 dentists in a day, eight of them have the same question. Oh, 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 Howard, uh, real quick. Uh, I'm in, uh, I'm in, uh, you know, Missouri. Um, I need about, 10 or 15, if I just had 10 or 15 or 20 extra new patients a month, all, all my problems would be solved. Uh, they always want to do that. And then you're, um, I mean, you are the master in Facebook. Hell, your son started it. Um, I wanted to tell you, I wanted you to tell us, how, I know they did a, since the last time we talked, you were on episode 58, you were on 361, you were on 662, and this one's going to be like 1,600, so you came a 1,000 shows later. But um, explain to uh, the older farts 
um, the pivot from Facebook to Meta, uh, Meta. And do you really, if some dentist needed, you know, 15, 10, 15, 20 more new patients a month, what, what would you tell them? You've always been a um, really massively into marketing. What, what would you tell them? Well, you know, back in 2010, Howard, when you got me to write that first article, it was, does my office need a Facebook page? Um, and, and my answer then was yes, and very few dentists in 2010 had Facebook pages. Now they've all got them, but the question they should be asking is, is, is my Facebook page working for me? Um, you know, or, or use a generic term, is my social media presence working for me? Because a lot of dentists... Um, don't do the next step. They don't hire a professional marketer, ma marketer to manage them. They think that, okay, I paid someone some money or I set up, you know, a Facebook, an Instagram, um, maybe a Twitter, maybe some dentists now are setting up TikToks. Um, I got all those pages, but I'm not getting the new patients. What am I doing wrong? And there's still a whole lot of fine tuning that you've got to, um, apply to this. So, um, you know, I mean, we could spend easily another hour or two talking about social media. Um, um, but basically, there's two types of content that an office puts out on their social media page. Um, there's either brand generated content, which um, is anything that you produce yourself, either through a third party or maybe a staff member or the dentist himself puts up a link to an interesting story and puts content on their Facebook page. And then there's user-generated content. So for, um, for brevity, I refer to these as BGC for brand-generated, UGC for user-generated content. And not enough offices are relying on UGC. UGC is the content that's most believable by the general public. They're gonna believe stuff that they see from other people. It's like you're buying something on Amazon and you know I won't get into the whole topic of fake reviews on Amazon, but in general, people who are buying things, they look at reviews and reviews are powerful and what's extra powerful are reviews from people who they know already. So, for example, if you can get a patient of yours that's a very satisfied patient to write a thrilling post on their own Facebook, on their own social media platform, whichever one it is, there you're essentially transforming that person into an influencer. The more, the more context they have on social media, the louder their voice is heard. And when they broadcast to their network of friends, they're essentially screaming out to them, hey, this is my dentist, and my dentist is great, and you should be using my dentist. So, um, you know, used to be in the old days, Howard, I mean, you and I are both sort of dinosaurs in this profession. You know, we're, we're not, um, you know, like the young uns, but um, in the old days, when a patient that we just finished a great case on thanked us and was thrilled with the case. I don't know about you, you know, it made me smile. Um, it made me say to myself internally, oh, good, I'll probably get paid for this case. Um, but it, it didn't dawn on me to take that to the next level. You know, maybe some of us said, tell your friends about us, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but it didn't dawn us on us, and we didn't have a way to tap into that power of um, recommendation potential from that person. Now we do. Um, if we can engineer that loving patient who would basically go to the end of the earth for us into someone who's willing to put out a message on social media, that becomes the best form of UGC or user-generated content that we can get. That's like the most powerful thing we can put on social media. And that's going to um, be the best usage of social media to get us new patients. Well, Ed, you know how I can prove that you're not very old at all? You just talked about P. Gingivalis 
uh, on and on and on, and you didn't even uh, mention that it's linked to erectile dysfunction. So uh, I don't want to. I don't want to tell you why I know that. Uh, but uh, my it gosh, is, it is. I, but but I, 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 the articles that are going to prove that have not yet been published. So we're very careful about what we say. Well, I'll but tell you what, man. I think dentistry. A bacterial link. I think to, dentistry could go next level if they start advertising. Get your teeth cleaned every six months, uh, so you don't need Viagra. Uh, you know what I mean? Uh, you know. Um, um, yeah, I think that is amazing. Uh, my gosh. Um, Ed, I, uh, I could talk to you for 40 days and 40 nights. I know the minute I uh, walk out of the room, I'm going to wish I uh, talked to you some, but it's an honor to have you come on the show. If you ever want to come back on the show, do it again. In fact, I retired. I uh, The pandemic, I was booked out 32 to 50, whatever, lectures for 30 years, and I just never thought I would uh, quit doing it, and then it took a pandemic to, to, to cancel everything, and... All my lectures canceled. I sat home for a year. And then a year later, my team met me and said, okay, you got the second vax. We're ready to go. Here's the list we're going to go ahead and sign you up for. And I said, no, I because what happened during the pandemic is I basically spent the whole pandemic with, you know, my oldest son, Eric, have four kids, grandkids. And and, um, and then uh, Zach's out here in Apache Junction. He's got two. And then Ryan's out here in Goodyear. He's got two. And after I spent that whole pandemic with eight grandchildren, there was no way I was going to go back to my previous life. So uh, I've listened yep. to, um, so I retired this podcast, but when you sent me an email and said, you want to come on the show, I called up Kyle. I said, we got to get the band back together just for Ed. And so this is a Friday. Um, Kyle, everybody came after their, uh, their other job just to do it. So this has got to be special to you, buddy, because uh, this show's retired and we came back just to get you on. Tell okay. your lovely wife, Karen. Hello. Tell Mark, uh, good luck with, uh, um, um, his pitch is pivot to meta and thank you so much for coming on the show. You're just a legend in my mind. You always will be. And thanks for sharing your thoughts. And if you have next time you have a burning thought, we'll get the band back together. Just thanks for you. coming out of retirement for me, Howard. You Absol- know where it all started for me. Absolutely, man. You're the best. Have a all great, right. have a great Friday. Take care. Bye-bye.